Welcome everyone Welcome to our April seminar series. Um, we are super excited to have Dr. Erin Finley here, who is going to talk about a topic I'm so excited to learn about on um, agile methods for complex implementation um, and really focusing on integration of ethnography and um, periodic reflections into implementation science trials. Um, so Dr. Finley is an associate professor in the departments of medicine and psychiatry and behavioral science at, sciences at UT Health San Antonio, and she founded and directs a dissemination and implementation science consultation, consultation core in the Center for Research to Advance Community Health. She's also a research investigator with the Center for the Study of Implementation, Innovation, and Policy at the LA Veterans Healthcare System. And she's a medical anthropologist and implementation scientist. She does amazing work on qualitative research, mixed methods, um, and implementation. So I am so excited um, to have her here to learn today. So thanks so much, Erin, for joining. I am very happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I love to talk about these things. So this is very fun. Well, thanks everybody for joining when it's hot and it might be nice to be outside in the park. I appreciate that. It's raining here, so it's not that exciting. There's nobody demanding my attention outside with flowers and sunshine. Um, let's go ahead and kind of talk a little bit. I'm going to say a lot of things that are my opinion and no one else's necessarily. Um, I'm going to talk about a variety of different studies we've used these methods in, so I want to certainly acknowledge those funding. But I think actually all of the studies here today are all VA studies, so these are all from the VA side. But you'll see that I have the great good fortune to work with many tremendous people and um, all of their ideas are reflected here as well. So none of, none of this happens solely onto itself. So I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about what can ethnography do? It's this sort of mysterious thing that I hear people talking about sometimes, but we don't really talk about what it's useful for very often. So I kind of wanted to start there. And then talk a little bit about some different kinds of ethnographic methods um, and how they can really help us to be a little bit more light on our feet in some of the studies that we do, because they can help us bring in continuous information in a relatively pragmatic way so that we're able to both see things that we didn't necessarily know to look for beforehand and also be responsive to challenges as they come up. And then I just had some other thoughts to share that we can talk about as we go. And I apologize to anybody who's heard this story before, but this is so profoundly kind of how I came to implementation science and that I always have to start here, which is that I trained as a medical anthropologist and my first um, real ethnographic field work was funded by National Science Foundation. I came to San Antonio to study um, experiences of PTSD among white and Latinx veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan. This was in 2007 and 2008, and I was based, ended up being based out of a PTSD specialty care clinic at the VA in San Antonio. What I didn't know was at that time, there was this thing called evidence-based psychotherapies that were suddenly being introduced into VA just about the same time that I was arriving. So it was, it was totally accidental, but it was a really interesting time because we were so deeply in the thick of Iraq and Afghanistan. We were losing so many service members. We had a lot of catastrophically injured service members, and we had a tremendous number of veterans coming back with really profound PTSD. We also were in this moment where you couldn't turn on the radio in the morning without hearing about a scandal at Walter Reed or a scandal at VA. So there was this intense sense that there was a lot of need. The VA was not doing a very good job in responding. There was also, if you went out to the community, which I was doing a lot because I was doing a very broad scope ethnography, that we had this opportunity to fix what we had done wrong after Vietnam. And we weren't doing it. We weren't getting there. So there was a lot of pressure. It, was very, it felt very high stakes at the time. What was interesting also in the clinic, and of course this was all new to me, was we had providers with kind of really different perspectives on how do you care for veterans with trauma. We had a whole generation of um, particularly psychologists who had been trained in a more psychodynamic tradition and had been training veterans from Vietnam for 20, or taking care of veterans from Vietnam for 20 years. And then we had sort of a new generation of providers coming in who were primarily trained more in cognitive behavioral therapies, had a very different perspective. Um, 
And they looked at these new treatments very differently. And it caused quite a bit of conflict within some of the clinics that I was encountering. Also, the treatments themselves, they were not aligned with existing norms or clinic structures at all. The structure had, the clinic had to completely redo how they were assigning patients, everything. And what it all added up to was really just the sense that implementation was really high stakes. It was really fraught. It mattered a lot. And it was inconsistent because some people wanted to do it and some people didn't want to do it. And it was slow. And I say that because now it's 15 years later, right? And I think if you look at PTSD care in the VA, implementation of evidence-based psychotherapies is relatively normalized. It's pretty much routine at this point. Um, this is a wonderful article on that process over time that was led by Craig Rosen. And if you look at it, it's a, it's a great story of thinking about implementation over the long term. Where do we see successes? Where do there continue to be challenges? It's also a story of innovation and adaptation in ways that I don't think were expected, but that have really occurred at the patient level, the provider level, the clinic level, the system level. It was innovation ended up being very pervasive throughout this process. And I really came to implementation scientists as an ethnographer accidentally. And then I went off and became an implementation science and didn't think about ethnography for a number of years in my career because I was learning to do all sorts of other kinds of health services research. But the more I've done implementation over time, the more I come back to ethnography as a handy tool to have in the toolkit as we think about dealing with these kinds of problems, particularly these really complex implementation efforts that are looking at phenomena occurring over time. But that's what I want to talk about today. So ethnography, we throw it around a lot, but what are we actually talking about? So we're really thinking about both kind of a set of methods and a philosophical approach. So ethnography is going to be really grounded in people's actions and experiences of the world. Um, we're thinking about this in terms of insider viewpoints or emic viewpoints, trying to understand how a problem is seen by the people who are really dealing with it. Not always, but typically, and you'll see in the way I define ethnography, it's also really about close engagement with a social group over time. So we're often talking to the same people over time so we can get a sense of how things are evolving. And definitely using multiple methods to allow for triangulation. So when people talk about ethnography, they're usually not talking about a single method. They're usually talking about kind of a package of methods that have been put together to allow for multiple vantage points on a problem. Uh, I will also say that some graphic methods are great tools for investigating behavior in a natural environment. They're super helpful for kind of understanding what is actually happening and why. I'll come back to this point a little bit later too. They're wonderful observe for observing the difference between what people say and what they do, because these are rarely quite the same thing. Um, they're fantastic because they allow you to be attentive to context at multiple levels. So just in that story about PTSD, there were all these different things that were happening. So there was the community pressure, there was the national pressure, there were all these veterans coming into the system, there was what was happening within the clinic, there was the treatments themselves. And when we look at implementation science theories, models, frameworks, of course, we have all those different levels. But ethnography can be a really lovely tool for tuning into which levels are most important at a given time for a given problem. And as I said, they typically involve bringing together multiple methods. So observation, interviewing, field notes, document analysis, surveys, all of those can be part of a package of ethnography. And then when we kind of stop to think about what can you do with ethnography and these kinds of approaches, to some extent, we can use them for the same kinds of goals that we reach towards when we use qualitative research and implementation science more broadly. So there was the fantastic Qualris report that came out from NCI a few years ago, and it kind of listed, so what are some of the roles that qualitative research plays in implementation science? And it's everything from eliciting participant and partner-centered perspectives, informing design and implementation, looking at context, getting documentation, understanding effectiveness and mechanisms for change, all of these different things. And ethnography can be used as a tool really for all of these different types of things as well. Uh, a great article um, that was came out a couple of years ago now it was led by Alex Gertner. And he, he and his team looked at, conducted a scoping review of ethnographic methods in implementation science. And they found, you know, you can find evidence of this going back to 2004, but there's certainly been an uptick, uptick in the last decade or so seeing these kinds of methods used in implementation. 
they're not niche. They're actually used across a wide variety of academic journals. Um, many times they do use some kind of implementation theory model framework. So they're pretty consistent with the, the focus in implementation science on theory. And uh, the studies actually had a lot of diversity in how they were using ethnographic methods. It was most commonly to assess context and barriers of facilitators, but it was, these kind of methods were also used to test different kinds of implementation strategies or develop tools or methods. So they can be used in a, a variety of different ways. And I, I reproduced this slide with full thanks and apologies um, from the great Carl May, but I really love it because I think it does such a nice job of conveying the tension in implementation science between implementation science, which is very disciplined and structured, and this is how we set up grants and our scientific inquiry, and we are trying, we are using controlled studies. And this is the kind of implementation science um, we mentioned the, the consultation court that I'm trying to help folks put in place so that they can do rigorous science. But on the other hand, if we actually go and try and implement something, it's completely different, right? It's nonlinear, it's dynamic, it's messy, it's emergent. There's a lot of different players involved. There's a lot of different contexts, super messy. So how do we bring together the fact that we have this beautiful, rigorous discipline science because we're trying to learn generalizable things and we also have to grapple with this very messy context in real world. So one of the, for me, one of the benefits of ethnographic work is it gives us some really beautiful tools for doing that because you can set up rigorous structured methods that are still flexible enough and agile enough to help us capture what's unpredictable, what wasn't included in the original conceptual models, but we may actually turn out to make all the difference in the end. So this is, a, this is a wonderful article, it's a great example. Um, so it was an ethnographic study that was conducted a few years ago by Carolyn Tennant and a group of UK researchers. And they were looking at uh, inpatient wards in hospitals in Scotland that were trying to implement a six-step treatment bundle for sepsis with the idea that providers who identified a new case of sepsis on the ward were supposed to walk through these six steps within an hour of identifying this case. And this, they had heard this wasn't working. They were trying to figure out why. So they conducted 300 hours of non-participant observation. They used field notes to document what they were seeing. And they accompanied this by semi-structured interviews of providers. And of course they found implementation wasn't happening, but it wasn't because providers weren't trying. They actually, the nurses and providers all agreed the bundle was valuable. It was effective. And they were trying to go through the six steps. But when they, what they started to see when they were doing the observation was that each one of the six steps required coordination with all these different other people in order to achieve something relatively simple like getting blood culture. Well, you gotta find the person to get the blood and you gotta have the order and you gotta have the equipment and all these things had to be brought together at one time. So by stepping back and taking the time to do some of that initial observation, they were able to identify where the real world challenges were and offer some much more pragmatic solutions for how they were gonna actually get through these steps in a realistic way. The other thing I love about ethnography is it, it's so helpful for understanding where change is occurring over time. So in the intervention, in the practice setting, in the larger ecology during in, in which implementation is trying to take place. And of course, this is beautifully aligned with the dynamic sustainability framework, um, which I do really love just because it encourages us to be attentive to where change might be occurring multiple levels as implementation proceeds. Um, I will say again, as ethnographic approaches allow us to capture and document what's occurring, they really allow us to be responsive to new and unexpected issues as they arise. Um, they can be supportive of not only the opportunity to observe what we haven't expected, so we haven't looked for it, um, but also to help us in, in mobilizing rapid responses. So we'll talk a little bit about ethnographic methods. And then I'll kind of come back to the issue of how do we think about integrating these within the kind of hybrid effectiveness implementation studies, which tend to be more structured and, and many moving parts. So if you ask a medical anthropologist, they will tell you, you cannot do ethnography without observation. I don't really agree with that, mostly because it's just not feasible oftentimes in the kind of work that we do. However, it is a wonderful tool. Just this basic idea that we're gonna step back and look at folks' usual behavior performed in the usual environment by the usual participants to get a better understanding of, for example, how work is actually performed. 
And this Weston article is really lovely. They also have a great discussion of field notes. So if you're interested at all in field notes, there's a lovely conversation about that in, the, in this paper. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier that gap between what we say and what we do. And, and I don't mean to imply that we as humans are trying to be duplicitous when we're reporting on our own behavior. Certainly that can happen, but most often it's not that. It's more that we're trying to, we're like fish trying to describe swimming in water. There's so much we take for granted about our environments and how we move through them and why we're doing the things we do that it can be very hard to articulate a lot of those. So observation can help you see where there may be gaps, but oh, and then go back to folks and say, now I noticed that you said this and then this happened. Can you help me understand that? And that can be a really powerful lens onto understanding why, why we're all doing the things we do. Participant uh, observation can obviously be participant observation, which is more, which would be more like healthcare providers um, conducting observation as while they're engaging in healthcare. But most of the time, because healthcare it has such a high bar for participation, it, it's more non-participant observation in these kind of contexts. I think there's something really powerful too about just being there and how consistent presence can help us to build better trust and. Um, get more frankness out of people. I mean, one of the things, even just going back to the original ethnogra ethnographic story I was talking about with PTSD in the clinic, I mean, it's never in the focus group that you really learn what's going on. It's in the elevator afterwards, most of the time. I mean, it's in those interactions that go on around what we think are the important events that you often get the most honest description of, of what's happening. So being present to be part of those conversations can also really be powerful. Um, oftentimes, when we're talking about observation in implementation science, we're talking about site visits. Um, they're, they're so powerful. We haven't gotten to do them much the last few years. I think they're coming back to some extent, but we also realize how hard they are. But they allow you not just to see behavior, but also to see locations and spaces and who's congregation, congregating where and who's talking to who and all of those things that end up being so absolutely critical as we're trying to think about creating environments that support the sorts of changes and improvements we wanna see. So field notes, um, we don't have to talk a lot about this, but I just wanna note it that they're, they're essentially just a detailed written description of verbal or nonverbal events. So it can be, you had this conversation and you're taking notes on the conversation, but it can also be, even if you're doing like formalized data collection with interviews or focus groups, they can be very valuable to describe a lot of the nonverbal stuff that went on around, for example, a focus group, who sat where, who was making side eye at who, all of those things can be super helpful in understanding context. Um, field notes are also great because they can be more or less structured depending on your research goals. So for example, if you were using field notes to try and um, capture fidelity of implementation of evidence-based practice, you would probably want a pretty structured note template because you want to be looking at sort of, okay, what are the different pieces of the intervention and how do we assess in observation how faithful this was or was not to it? Um, if you're looking at something that's more about social dynamics or something like that, that would probably be less structured. But the, the great thing to know about flip field is there's a lot of flexibility in how they're set up and how they are used. And they can even be integrated as a pretty low burden method into things like standing meetings, if those meetings are really important and you think it's gonna be important to use those as a big source over time. The other thing to mention is ethnographic interviewing. And a lot of folks talk about ethnographic interviewing as sort of interviewing that asks about culture. Um, as a very biased medical anthropologist, I would say it's hard to do an interview that doesn't in some way ask about culture. So for me, that's not a super useful definition. Um, but I do really come back to this piece about interviews that are conducted repeatedly over time, typically with the same participants. Um, this gives you a smaller sample for sure. And that's something that has to be addressed, um, but it gives you so much potential for greater depth of understanding and greater ability to capture change. And of course, implementation science is all about change. So for us, it's really essential. Um, they're also really good for issues where there's a lot of, um, potential for not, not just change, but also complexity. You know, most of the time for things we really care about, often including our work, we don't think one thing. We think about 10 or 20 or 100 different things about the work we're doing. So if you give people a chance to sort of 
reflect with you over time about those things, you can come to a much richer understanding. Ethnographic interviewing, I will say, tends to be more semi or less structured, even unstructured than other kinds of interviewing, but it can be handled in a number of different ways. I will go ahead and say that I'm gonna talk in a little bit about some different kinds of ethnography where you can maybe do something more that's like site visits and a rapid ethnographic assessment in the front end of an implementation effort. And that strategy has been used really successfully to help in pre-implementation planning. So it's not always gonna be an issue of that deep contact over time. Um, but uh, even in those cases, you're gonna be getting a lot more kind of depth and texture to the information you're gathering because you are having that really in-depth um, engagement. Okay, so let's think a little bit now about how do we work with these kind of methods in some of the more complex implementation studies and particularly in hybrid effectiveness implementation approaches. Um, so of course the hybrid approaches are fantastic. They allow us to integrate implementation so much earlier into the research pipeline. So even when we're looking at early data for a clinical uh, or prevention practice, we might be trying to gauge its feasibility and acceptability using a hybrid type of approach. Um, similarly, even when the clinical evidence for practice is well-established, we may still wanna be collecting effectiveness data because we're working in a new population and we need to keep assessing you know, who's this gonna be good for, even as we're focusing more on implementation and rollout and how to do that successfully. So I love these kind of approaches. I think they've really revolutionized the way that many of us think about research translation and implementation, but they are often conducted in highly structured ways. So people not, may not automatically think about ethnographic methods as having a role. So I wanna give a few examples of how we've been able to integrate these kind of methods into the work that we're doing. So I'll, I'll stop and do a little bit of that. I'm gonna start by talking about the Empowered Query, which is a VA funded, essentially um, center program of research that was funded from 2015 to 2020. We now have a, the Empowered 2, which is a, a renewal with three new projects that we're doing as a hybrid type three. This was a hybrid type two. Um, and we were implementing three evidence-based practices to improve women veterans engagement and retention and care for high priority health conditions. So in this case, it was pre-diabetes, cardiovascular risk reduction, and depression and anxiety. We were using as an implementation bundle, uh, re replicating effective programs, which of course have been around forever, but enhanced with, a, with more multi-level partner engagement and a little bit more complexity theory. And we really ran into this challenge from the beginning. Uh, how do we document implementation context and events and phenomena across three different interventions in all these sites in real time. Um, and that encouraged us to get relatively creative, which is how we ended up developing the periodic reflection, which are essentially these light touch, quite low burden ethnographic interviews. Um, they are repeated conversations with members. In, in this case, we really started with members of the project team, so the PIs themselves, team members, site-based staff about ongoing events, challenges, what they were doing, where they were running into roadblocks, adaptations, and all the kind of who, what, why, and how of implementation. And I think sort of the secret sauce for these was that they were routinely scheduled. So they were always gonna be there. We did them monthly or bi-monthly in this study, We've used them in other ways I'll talk about later. Um, they had a flexible format, so you could talk about emerging issues, but we also had some core topics that we always came back to around kind of what are the main activities that have been happening? Where have there been adaptations? What kind of partner engagement have we had more recently? And then what have been the changes to the local or broader environment, including policy, which ended up being very important for us. We did not start out reporting those. You can, and we have done some in some other studies, but we really just did them as sort of near verbatim notes and kind of a field note. And we call them ethnographic or ethnographically informed because they really can't replace on-site observation. But they did allow for a lot of regular check-ins with the implementation team and for continual feedback and reflection while re events were fresh. Um, so not like a post-implementation interview where we might be looking back on events from six or 12 months later. So much more in the moment, which was really, really helpful. And we found these to be very flexible. They allowed us to pursue novel questions and probes if we needed to. They gave us a low burden way of having really strong documentation. Um, they did support reflection and sense-making among the team itself. And they were 
crafting that they were allowing close engagement over time and giving us these multi-layered perspectives because we were conducting them with different members of the team separately. So we could, we could put together these different perspectives. And I will say, if this is something you're ever interested in incorporating into a grant or you want to train folks on this, there's a two hour training on YouTube on this. It's egregiously long, but it might be helpful. So good to know. And again, I apologize for the small font here, but there's a larger principle I wanted to illustrate, which is that when we're thinking about how do we put ethnographic methods into an implementation evaluation, we typically begin by sort of mapping our methods in the data summary, which allows us to see, okay, what are all of our methods? Who are we talking to? Or what is, what is the data source and maybe the electronic medical record? Um, what is the function of that data source within our larger evaluation plan? And how do we think about this in terms of our research questions? How are we adequately addressing our research questions? And what are the time points that we're gonna be able to reflect in doing this? Um, so in the original Empower Query, we realized doing this pretty early on that we had a lot of qualitative data happening pre-implementation. And then we had a fair amount happening after implementation. But other than the actual administrative data that was gonna be longitudinal that we were gathering through the course of implementation, we had no qualitative information at all on what was actually happening at the sites. So adding in the periodic reflections allowed us to have a much more longitudinal qualitative data source to strengthen the, the overall body of the work we were doing. And we just, they were so useful to us from the very beginning. So even from the beginning, they were helping us to see changes in the context for implementation. Um, in this case, it does, this was an example of you know, we started doing Empower before VA was really considering doing mo much remote delivery of care at all. Actually, even the second iteration of Empower, which because we're working with women and women kept telling us we need virtual care options because we are busy and we cannot get to the clinic. We got Empower 2 funded before COVID ever happened because we just, it was so desperately needed in order to take care of our women veterans. Um, so, but even in the earlier iteration of Empower, we were seeing, you know, there's much more openness at the national level to these kind of remote delivery options than there had been at the time we went in for the funding. We were able to see actually kind of a window on this and adaptations that were happening. So for example, in our uh, diabetes prevention program um, intervention um, implementation we were doing, we were offering an in-person option and a virtual care option. And we, we were hearing stories back from the coaches running those DPP groups in person about these different things that they were doing that they didn't actually even think of as adaptations, but were really critical adaptations, like adding a walking group, um, bringing in fresh produce, um, adding a maintenance group at the end for folks who wanted to continue meeting. So there are all these things happening that folks weren't even necessarily thinking about, it. oh, we're making an adaptation, but really important for us to understand in terms of understanding longer term impact also able to see kind of how the implementation team itself was responding to implementation and coming up with changes over the course of time. So for example, if there was a real communication problem that came up, developing a form formal marketing strategy that was sort of intended to forestall that in future sites and being able to witness sort of where those moments arose and how the team responded so that we were able to build out more menu options for how um, these interventions were delivered in future sites. And again, just kind of thinking about how did we pull the reflections data together with other kinds of data? So for example, for the diabetes prevention program uh, project we did, um, we found in terms of the clinical outcomes that the online virtual DPP option gave women the greatest weight loss. Like I think it was seven pounds average for women in the online group versus four pounds average for women in the in-person group. So from a purely clinical perspective, you had women completing more sessions, they were more engaged, and they had greater weight loss with the online option. Um, in the reflections, we, we saw a lot of those adaptations that were happening in the in-person groups and learned something about you know, what's possible to do in an in-person group that might not be possible in the virtual group. It seemed as though the in-person group, there was a lot more social sharing, there was a lot more connectedness, um, but again, you didn't necessarily see as much weight loss. But understanding that helped us to develop more menu options for rolling out in future sites, which we have done now in, uh, in part 2.0. And then we interviews, we learned a lot about how women veterans appreciated the option to select a modality that worked for them. So if you just looked at the clinical data here, you might be like, no problem, the online groups are the best. 
But if you look at the reflections data and the interview data and the clinical outcomes data all together, you get a different picture of what's most likely to be valuable for whom over time and where is the role of choice in all of this. Switching over to a different part of that study, we also had a cardiovascular template that was introduced into the med electronic medical record. And in the Empower Query, we were also able to use data from the reflections to look at sites experiences of implementation. So uh, contextual factors, uh, when they were exposed to, to different implementation strategies, kind of small s within the larger rep implementation bundle, um, adaptations that were being made to the intervention and to the inter implementation plan over the course of implementation. Um, we were then able to map these data, which we could locate in time because of when the reflection took place against corresponding um, longitudinal data from the electronic medical record that looked at when the template was actually being used by the providers in the clinical encounter. Um, and this was a uh, electronic template to support enhanced screening referral for cardiovascular risk reduction among women veterans. So when was this being used in the clinical setting? So being able to pull together the reflections data and the administrative data in this way, in this kind of longitudinal way, was so helpful for visualizing events in the clinic and how they were temporally associated with uptake of the practice. Um, it really helped us to ask a lot and challenge our assumptions about a number of things. And then when we were able to do this across multiple sites, it gave us a whole different view of how the implementation had gone and sort of where the successes and challenges had been across multiple sites. I'll also just say, you know, we've used the reflections data in a number of ways. A number of other studies have begun using these in many, many ways. And kind of the thing that I take away from that is there is so much flexibility in the content that we can include in those reflections and the timing. Some folks use them quarterly, some folks use them monthly, or some folks have used them sort of at key moments of change. In, in who you are talking with in the reflections, maybe it's um, members of the implementation team, maybe it's members of the, at the site. It can vary a lot and it can really be tailored to the needs of the specific product. I will say in terms of analysis and, analysis and how these data can be analyzed, again, there's just a tremendous amount of flexibility. We've done ongoing analyses. We've done periodic analyses. We've done retroactive analyses. We've used them for formative evaluation and summative evaluation. Um, they can really be used with kind of inductive coding. They can be used to look at specific theoretical frameworks um, and, and deductive coding in those, using those. We've used rapid qualitative approaches, which of course don't use coding at all in the first pass. So they're, they're compatible with a lot of different strategies for analysis. They're compatible with a variety of theoretical frameworks. And you can report on them solely qualitatively, of course, as we've presented sort of as part of an integrated mixed method approach. Okay, I'm going to give two more quick examples and a couple of comments and then I go. Um, I want to say, too, that we have used reflections data as part of a longer, larger ongoing implementation evaluation of the Veteran Sponsorship Initiative, which is led by Drs. Joseph Geraci and Marion Goodman out of Columbia in the Bronx VA. I will say I have never seen a program with such rapid scale up and so much innovation in such a short period of time. I don't know what we would have done with the reflections because they ended up being so critical for helping us understand um, how different portions of the team ended up using a variety of implementation strategies over time. So as you can see in this initiative, there's really kind of three core lanes of effort around training and standardization, developing these interconnected networks across DOD, VA, uh, state and local partners and private partnerships as well. That's been critical. And then building a cross-system data infrastructure that allows for communication that's safe and protected and effective and fast across all of these different partners. But in doing this and in rolling this out, there's been a tremendous variety of implementation strategies that have been used and all of which have really been critical to the effort. Um, and I just can't imagine how we could have ever kept up with the rate of change if we hadn't had this kind of a flexible method as part of what we were doing. And then just also we have a, a hybrid type three rollout of critical time intervention, which is a time limited case management program for veterans with experience of homelessness for transitioning into community, uh, community housing. And this is one of those things where VA is contracting with local community agencies to deliver these services. So it can make intervention um, implementation very complex with all these different partners. We're implementing it in 32 sites across three waves. And really, once again, we ran into that challenge of, gosh, we've got 32 sites. We can't do site visits. But we also need to know how these sites are, are 
are managing with this pretty complicated intervention, pretty low resource organizations. Um, and so we integrated a lot of different methods. We started doing periodic reflections, not only with our implementation team, but also with uh, the VA liaisons for each of these sites. So without adding additional burn burden to the sites themselves, we were able to get a lot more, a lot better window onto some of the challenges they're working with in, in doing this implementation. And this has been just an amazing case study for us in thinking about how do we keep our methods for implementation evaluation very rigorous, very structured, very strong, but also really flexible and agile and able to account for continuous change because we have had a lot of staffing changes, a lot of policy changes, and a lot of things to account for that really had an impact for the implementation effort. Okay, I also just want to quickly note, there are a lot of different structured approaches to ethnographic assessment that have start, started to come out in the last few years, and they're all actually great. Um, so I, I've got a few slides of resources and citations at the end of the presentation. If you're interested in this at all, go look at these studies. They're fascinating, and people have used them um, so thoughtfully and to get such powerful and useful pragmatic data that I just really admire some of the work that's been done in this area. And I think it, I think it, they're such wonderful tools for our toolkit as we do this kind of work, which can be really challenging to do well. I do think it's also useful to stop and think about though, when you're thinking about ethnographic methods as something where you're repeatedly going back to people over time, is that those ongoing conversations become ongoing relationships. And those relationships may themselves have implications for implementation. So even without being approached as, for example, uh, a facilitation strategy or a specific kind of implement with any kind of implementation goal, um, this kind of data, deep data engagement can have an impact for the people who are involved that maybe thought of as an implementation strategy. So this is a lovely article that sort of stops to think about that dynamic and how it came up in a particular study. Um, so it's a great article and it's certainly worth thinking about if you're um, adopting methods like this since you're like, just how are you gonna account for that and work with that as part of, as part of the planning? Of course, every method has limitations. Um, ethnographic methods, I think they're increasingly be, being used in these lower dose kind of very pragmatic ways. So they're not as time and resources intensive as kind of ethnography um, formally used to be, but they still require time, commitment, and buy-in. People have to be willing to talk to you over time. Um, there's a tremendous amount of trust and psychological safety that has to be there for participants in order to make it worth it uh, for them and for us. Um, we always in our methods have to pay attention to reflexivity and power and ethics in how our data are gathered and shared. I don't think that's unique, but it's certainly very palpable when you're doing this kind of work because you do really develop relationships with the people you're working with and you want to honor and respect them. Um, and if you're interested in the kinds of research questions that are, are very specific and structured, things like, I wanna be able to precise, precisely articulate the frequency and dose of the implementation strategy and how that was delivered, or I want to be able to categorize adaptations according to the frame, things like that. That may not be ideal for these kind of more unstructured methods. These are really good for capturing things over time in sort of broad brush ways. We have, however, found that sometimes we can pick up those broad brush ways and then go back with follow-up and memory checking to get some of that more precise detail. So you just kind of have to think about what's the level of detail you need and is this the right method for that? Probably not in many cases. And then um, I also want to just note in that Gertner scoping review, they do a great job for um, laying out some of the recommendations for how to report on ethnographic approaches and implementation research, because what they really found in the scoping review is that nobody was saying exactly what they were doing and how it was ethnographic, they weren't defining their terms, they weren't re reporting on you know, who was collecting the data, and there were a lot of opportunities for improving the rigor of the methods as they were reported. I love to use tools like this in the front end as well because they help me plan better to do better work the whole time, not just at the end when I'm trying to get it published. So just to be aware that if you're thinking about this, this can be a great thing to kind of think with and saying, you know, is this a useful method for us? Is this gonna, do we have what we need to do it well? And uh, how might we think about this? So I think they did a lovely job putting that together. Okay, closing thoughts and then I'll stop. But. I think ethnographic approaches can just be so useful and valuable in understanding context um, and understanding kind of what ended up being the key events because it's very hard to predict what those are gonna be ahead of time. 
happen and seeing change over time and where it matters. They're so fabulous in terms of capturing what's messy and unexpected. Um, it's great to see the amount of innovation there has been in the field in terms of the number of pragmatic, like really practical, we can do this, strategies for using ethnographic methods, along with a lot of different kinds of study designs. I think they can be integrated in many, many kinds of studies. And they just integrate so beautifully with a variety of different qualitative and quantitative data when we're trying to more accurately describe world or real world implementation and be more rigorous in our work. Um, so lots of wonderful opportunities, lots of great innovations happening. Would love to talk about it. Let me just go ahead and say, and I think that we're planning to share the slides, that there's a lot of additional great resources and citations and wonderful things to read because people are doing amazing work in this area. So thank you so much for having me and for bearing with me. And I really look forward to having some questions and additional chat. Let me get out of the slides. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Erin. That was such a rich and in-depth presentation and so many really relevant resources and examples. So thank you. I feel like the field has really, really evolved in the last five years um, in a lot of good ways. This is really helpful.